I think I will. Yeah. Yeah, just for my ser- for the sermon. Sermon part. Yeah. Good morning. morning. Welcome to Lakewood Congregational Church. I am so glad to be back after two weeks away. It's good to be here, and it feels so good to see all of you again. Um, It feels good to worship God. Uh, I hope that you know here at Lakewood Congregational Church, we strive to be people of extravagant welcome which means that whether you are young or old, gay or straight, single or partnered, happy or sad, confused or inspired, street smart or college educated, whether you can't pay your bills or you have more than enough to share, no matter who you are and where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here in this place to worship a loving God who welcomes us all. And as we gather in this sanctuary, we join our hearts with those who are with us on live stream today, those who will watch later, and with those who are simply not with us worshiping uh, today in an embodied way, but who know that God connects our hearts together, that we hold each other in our hearts and recognize our connection as the body of Christ. And we pray that we might feel the connection of this sacred space both gathered and scattered. So this morning I'm going to uh, invite Catherine, Reverend Catherine up to make a couple of announcements because Rachel is out of town this week and uh, we are so grateful that she uh, gets to take a week away as we as a staff continue to take this kind of rotation of vacations uh, and it's a, it's a good thing for us to do. And so uh, Catherine, come on up and make some announcements. Well, good morning. I'm going to begin with, in your bulletin, there's the little thing right there that you can scan. The wonderful thing about scanning the QR code is that it opens up a plethora of things for you to find. The bulletin, events, other activities, and even ways to donate. Please feel free to use that site. What we've been doing and we're going to continue to do today is have one announcement. The announcement today will be a reminder that Sunday, August 7th, after a week of Vacation Bible School, we're gonna have some more time with God right out on the front porch. It's for all the members of the church. It's a Sunday evening, a time for us to get together, enjoy, and enjoy some mores. So we'll look forward to that, and we'll look forward to seeing you. So let's take a deep breath and prepare our hearts and our minds to be in an attitude of prayer, praise, and worship as we listen to the prelude.
Please stand as you are able and join with me in the call to worship. Let us gather in spirit and truth to worship the Holy One. Let us gather together with life and vibrancy. Let us praise God who reveals, questions, and listens. Let us come ripe with possibilities. Let us give thanks for God's abiding and faithful love. Let us come to proclaim the goodness of God and creation. Let us worship God as we sing our opening hymn, number 661. You might notice that our opening hymn is a little atypical. It is not a typical four-part hymn. It is a round. So the way we're going to sing this is, if you look at it, there are three different strains that say number one, two, and three, what does the Lord require of you? Justice. And so what we're going to do is we're going to sing it through each part in a row. So one, two, and three. And then we're going to try doing a bit of a round where this side of the church is going to start off first, then the middle, and then that side. I don't know how that's going to go. Might be a bit of a free-for-all, but that's how rounds work. So that's absolutely all right. You can't do it wrong. Just sing out loud and straight. Join with me in the prayer of invocation. <laughs> Divine gardener, we need your care and nurture. Fertilize our souls. Plant seeds of wisdom, inspiration, and discernment. Prune us today for more abundance tomorrow. Refresh us with living water. Revive us again. Amen.
Thank you so much. This is our summer pickup choir, which means that they don't rehearse. They just get together on Sunday morning before church, and they run it through, and they sing it. And uh, wow, did you do so beautifully today. And uh, others are certainly welcome to join. Uh, ben has a list of, of what weeks the Summer Pickup Choir will perform. Um, as we head into our um, into a spirit of prayer, I, I'll mention that as a part of that, it was so great to have Richard Foote singing. Um, where did you go? Oh, there you are. Uh, Judy and Richard are in town. Uh, they are um, members of the church, but uh, moved out to the East Coast, and uh, we miss them dearly, but know that they are in the good hands of a good congregational church there, uh, being taken care of and worshiping God uh, in, in that way, but also continuing to be a part of our church family, and we're just so grateful to have you here and grateful that you felt comfortable jumping into our pickup choir. As we come into a time of prayer, um, there's, there's so much we have to be grateful for. Uh, this weekend, particularly, it just felt very real that, we, uh, we are, that, that summer kind of creates this feeling of community, of uniting people together. Um, here in Lakewood, we had a, a couple of big summer events, and then uh, I had the, the strange and unique opportunity to uh, to volunteer at the Crazy Ball booth at the Strongsville Homecoming, and uh, and and watching the way that that people uh, gather and and spend time together is a gift of the summer, um, and so we come with gratitude for that, uh, and and we also know that we still come with so many concerns on our hearts. Uh, um, illnesses and grief and uh, struggles in life, and uh, we carry all of that here with us. Um, we also know that uh, there are just so many comings and goings, people traveling, people getting ready to go to college, ready to uh, head off to their next adventure and ready to return here, and so we pray for the comings and the goings. Will you join with me in prayer? Gracious God, you gather us here in your dwelling place. Here physically in this sanctuary and this holy ground, and here remotely in the sanctuary and the holy ground that is our living rooms and our cars and our walk in the park. We thank you for the way that you gather us, that it is not so literal that we get to dwell with you where we are. Lift us up, O God, into your holy presence. Remind us of the vastness of your glory and of the intimacy of your presence within each of our hearts. God, we know that there is nothing we can do to deserve or undeserve your love. But we still ask, O oh God, that you might make us worthy of you. That you might teach us always to do what is right, that we might just come a little closer to deserving your love. We pray, O oh God, for your people, for our friends and for our neighbors, for those who are near to us, and for our enemies and to our strangers, that we might see your face in each of them, that we might learn to draw nearer to each other, recognizing that it is in seeing your presence in one another's hearts that we grow together, that we make your kingdom known. We pray for those who are going through treatments, awaiting test results, asking questions about the aches and pains in their bodies. We pray for those who are uncertain about the path ahead. We pray for those who are struggling with mental illness in all its many forms with those seeking recovery and those who are in it, with those who haven't yet sought recovery. 
We pray for our enemies, O oh God. We pray for those whose behavior we reject. And yet we seek that you might help us to be reconciled in whatever form that looks like. Not to be best friends, O oh God, but to see the humanity in one another. We ask that you give us the grace to turn away from the paths that are in the wrong direction for us, for the paths that hurt others. Give us the grace to repent of, our, um, of any rejection we have created of your image. Give us the grace to repent of our racism, our sexism, our classism. Give us the grace to repent of the ways that we have caused harm to one another. And give us the strength and the fortitude to keep our promises even when it is hard. God, we ask your presence all over this vast world, this vast universe, that you might make yourself known in the places that are particularly alone and struggling and aching that you might make your presence known in Ukraine and in war-torn lands all throughout the world, that you might make yourself known in refugee camps and in migrant uh, journeys, that you might make yourself known in the places where there is not enough water or not enough healthy water that you might make yourself known in the households that feel lonely and broken. That you might make yourself known here in Lakewood, in Rocky River, in Fairview, in Cleveland. That you might make yourself known in Akron as they experience continued turmoil and racial division. God, give us the generosity, the awareness, the ability to create abundance when we are afraid or when we feel scarce. Help us to turn our faces towards you, O oh God, when we do not know where else to go. And help us to turn our faces towards you, O oh God, even when we do know where to go. Keep us from stumbling. Keep us in integrity and keep our chins up as we follow in your way and as we pray together in Jesus' name, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're invited now to give back to this world and to this community through the work of this church, recognizing that we do that through our gifts, our financial gifts, our gifts of time, our gifts of talent and with our uh, ongoing commitment to the work of this church. And so we do so now as we uh, take our Sunday morning offering and as we uh, pray together what it might look like to give back to God.
Let us pray as we dedicate our gifts together. Gracious God, we offer not only our thanks, but also our gifts, knowing what you have done all along, rescuing the lost, healing the broken, feeding the hungry, loving the poor, will continue to be done through our gifts. Bless all that we offer to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, Joanna asked me to read uh, two translations of this short psalm. Um, the first is the uh, New Revised Standard Version, which is in your bulletin. Um, the second is an adaptation by Stephen Mitchell, a biblical scholar and translator um, from his book, A Book of Psalms, selected and adapted from the Hebrew. So first, uh, the regular version, I guess you could say, that's in your bulletin. Psalm 15. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly and do what is right and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors, in whose eyes the wicked are despised, but who honor those who fear the Lord, who stand by their oath, even to their hurt, who do not lend money at interest and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. And Stephen Mitchell's translation of the psalm. Lord, who can be trusted with power and who may act in your place? Those with a passion for justice, who speak the truth from their hearts, who have let go of selfish interests and grown beyond their own lives, who see the wretched as their family and the poor as their flesh and blood. They alone are impartial and worthy of the people's trust. Their compassion lights up the whole earth and their kindness endures forever. Thank you. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth, the words that come from my mouth today, and the meditations that are in your hearts, in the hearts of those listening, may they be not only acceptable in your sight, but also give glory to you and expand the presence of your vision. For you are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. So it's wonderful to be back in worship with you all this morning. Um, I, I want to extend, I guess, my, my gratitude to Irene and to Mark, um, who preached these past two Sundays. They're both people who I uh, have a ton of respect for and gratitude to have them um, in my life and to have them as colleagues. Um, I did listen to both of their sermons, to each of their sermons, and I would really encourage you to do so too if you didn't yet, um, if you uh, took those Sundays off like I did. Um, then, uh, then you might go back and listen. Uh, Irene preached a, a beautiful sermon about um, uh, really looking at the, the church's role in uh, responding to messy uh, crises in people's lives and, and what is it for the church to do and what is it for social services to do and, and how do we know um, how to work together in that. She used a refrain a few times um, that the church too often will say, too messy, no thanks. Too messy, no thanks. I don't want to do that work because I don't think I know how to do it. That's, that's some of what Irene uh, spoke about so beautifully. 
um, in a way that I, I think will stick with me for a long time. And then, then Mark, uh, Reverend Mark Pettis, he uh, uh, reflected on the Good Samaritan and the unlikely places that we sometimes find the Good Samaritans, where they show up and how, and um, he asks the question of where do we find them today and, and when are we the Good Samaritan and, and where do we look for them? I felt really connected Actually, in my, in my distance, in, in being away and taking vacation, I did not listen to the announcements because that felt like work. But I did listen to the sermons because that felt like praising God. And so I was grateful for that. It made me particularly grateful for the work that we have uh, been forced to do to create a live stream uh, situation that allowed for this to happen. Um, that kind of uh, um, the forced goodness that came out of the pandemic um, of, of being able to be connected from afar. And um, it also made me think, um, I saw Mark yesterday, and, uh, and he said, you know, at LCC, the bench is deep. The bench is deep. We have a lot of good preachers in this congregation, and I am just so grateful that I can step away and that Reverend Catherine is here, uh, that, that Mark is here, that Irene is here, that, um, uh, that George is here, that, you know, we have just so many good preachers, and so I felt grateful. Today's uh, psalm, Psalm 15, um, the psalmist asks this question, who gets to be in God's tent? Who gets to be up on God's hill? It's an interesting question for a church like ours that uh, works so hard to uh, remind people that all are welcome, that every person is welcome in this space. And then we have this question that kind of throws us a little bit for a minute. Who gets to be in God's tent? Who gets to be up on God's hill? Are there requirements that must be met for rightful attendance and participation? And if so, what are they? What is required to be able to get into that tent, to be able to get up on that hill? And so the psalmist answers this a few ways. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the NRSV translation, the first one that's printed in your bulletin, and in a little bit I'll, I'll come back to the second one that I asked Mike to read. Um, but the, um, the, the psalmist lists a few things to walk blamelessly and to do what is right. To walk blamelessly and to do what is right. What does it mean? To get into the tent, you have to walk blamelessly and do what is right. So the psalmist says um, that includes truthful speech, speaking honestly, um, speaking out of our hearts, both, both about uh, what we're thinking on our, our kind of inner hearts, what is the truth of what is in our hearts, but then also to speak the truth and, and speak in love about our neighbor. Uh, the psalmist says good conduct towards our neighbor, to, to not slander our friends, to not do evil to our neighbor, to not live uh, in vengeance, to take up reproach. The psalmist says that we get into the tent if, um, if we uh, are aligned with God's will. The psalmist says we get to get up on that hill if um, we have integrity and fidelity in keeping our word. The psalmist says that um, we get to go up on that hill if we refuse to engage in financial exploitation of the vulnerable, if we don't lend it interest, if we don't take a bribe against the innocent. So I gotta say, if, if there's a tent, um, 
that's a pretty hard one to get into. That's a pretty hard tent to get into. If it's a hill, it's a rocky one, right? And if this is actually a tent, I don't think it's one I'm allowed in. I don't know about all of you. I can't say with honesty and integrity that I have gone every moment of my week in this way. I can't say that I've walked blamelessly and done what is right every step of my journey. Can you? Can you? If this is a tent, it's not one I'm allowed in. If this is a, a holy hill, then I don't think it's one I get to be on. But thanks be to God, we do not worship a God who gathers the perfect ones together in a tent and tells the other ones they can't come. Thanks be to God, we don't worship a God who says only the perfect ones are allowed on the hill. If this is a tent, if it's a tent at all, then I want to know how big it is, right? I want to know uh, who, who gets to be there and what does it look like and how large is it? If it's a hill, I want to know, is it the whole world? Because I don't know anyone who can say that they have done all of these things every step of the way, that they've walked blamelessly and done what is right every second of this week. We all mess up. We mess up a lot. And we worship a God who is filled to the brim with grace upon grace upon grace. It's interesting. Um, the, I think, actually, this, this piece about... Um, uh, those who do not lend money at interest. Um, th this piece about uh, the people who are allowed in the tent are the ones who refuse to engage in financial exploitation of the vulnerable. Um, it occurred to me this week, and I read a couple commentaries about how that's actually the most commonly discussed um, sin or separation in the Bible, um, is financial exploitation of the poor. And yet it's, it's probably one of the most common practices of our day-to-day -day life uh, here in, in our community, in our society. Um, we had to buy a van this week. Um, it, it's not a good time to buy a car, and we had to do it. And let me tell you that we were financially exploited in the, the system of, of kind of how the interest works and, and how much cars cost right now. Uh, financial exploitation of the vulnerable is one of God's most uh, despised um, efforts of, of, of the community, and it's also one of the most common. Um, that's a little bit of an aside. But the point is, if this is a tent, if this is specifically how we get in, if the way that we get into this tent of, of God's glory to be able to worship God is to... Uh, is to walk blamelessly and to do what is right, then it is not a tent that any of us are welcome in. So the actual question um, is more like this. It's, it's who gets to be close to God and how do we get close to God? How do we feel closest to God? What does it look like to, um, to feel as if we are connected to the work and the mission and the vision and the kingdom that God has in mind for us? What does it feel like to be close? And, and the answer is that we feel closest to God when we are walking blamelessly and doing what is right. But here in, in the psalm and, and many times throughout the Bible, um, we are reminded that, that the closest we get to God is when we care for the vulnerable, when we stand up for those in distress, when we fight for a, a world where all are welcome and loved and seen in the image of God. Um, in, in James, I think um, the letter from James is, is not so different, that religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this 
to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. It's not so different from the ask in Psalm 15. So how do we feel close to God? How do, we, how do we feel that closeness? How do we feel that connection? And is closeness a tent? Is it a hill? Is it a, a specific space that we go to? What does close mean? So in a minute here, I, I want to reflect a little bit actually more about the, the pilgrimage that we took to Alabama three weeks ago. Um, we haven't had much of a chance to reflect on that, that um, myself and, uh, and Mike, my husband, and the, uh, Heather and Eric Tuck McCullough, who are not here this week, that the four of us, along with uh, 22 others from Northeast Ohio, from United Church of Christ Congregations in Northeast Ohio, we traveled down to uh, Alabama for a civil rights pilgrimage um, to, to go through uh, kind of the footsteps from, uh, from Montgomery to Selma to Birmingham. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But when I think of closeness, first I want to mention this really amazing thing that happened this week in our world, I want to mention the James Webb Space Telescope. So who saw these images that were released this week of, this, uh, of, of the new uh, photos of the telescope, from the telescope? They show uh, how the infrared observatory um, that, that they created, I mean, this stuff is just completely blows my mind. I'm looking for Melissa. Oh, there you are, she works for NASA. I just have decided that Melissa did everything NASA. So, and it's not true at all, but I just think of her because I think she's amazing. Um, but they, they, uh, they this, this telescope, it uncovered these unseen aspects of our universe showed us deeper into the universe than anything we've ever seen. We've tried to imagine it, I think, but, but shows us deeper than anything we've ever seen. And uh, this, this representation of thousands of galaxies that humankind has never seen, these far-off systems that we cannot even begin to imagine, and when I look at them, I have to say that when I look at them, I see the glory of God. I cannot see anything other than God's creation. It's so beautiful to me to imagine that, that everything, all of God's love is so far beyond anything I've ever imagined. It's far beyond what we can see with the human eye, let alone all of these centuries of technology that we've built upon and built upon. And so then when I read Psalm 15, and it says, who gets to dwell in God's tent? I just think about how much I don't want to be in a tent. If that's out there, right? If that's out there, I don't want to be in a tent. But I do want to be close to God. And I do know that we can be close to God whether we are uh, on a holy hill, whatever that meant to the psalmist in that time, or whether we are looking out at these deep, far away, undiscovered galaxies. I know that God is there, as close to us as our breath and as far away as those galaxies we didn't know existed before. So what this scripture is really, really about is, is how do we get close to God? How do we feel close to God? How do we feel close to God's mission? How do we feel as if we are walking in the way of Christ? How do we do that? One of the themes that really arose for me throughout the pilgrimage uh, in Alabama was the way that throughout the museums, um, there was this, this uh, tug of war with Christianity. 
with what it meant, with what it meant to be a Christian. So early on in the, um, we went to the, uh, the Legacy Museum, um, the Equal Justice Initiative Legacy Museum, which was this incredible walk from uh, slavery through, um, through lynching, through segregation, through incarceration. And often in that museum, it pointed to the times when when people use Christianity as an endorsement of slavery. Talked about how to be close to God, it meant to encourage this segregation. There were times, and I'll read a few quotes, there were times when Christianity was used to say, who gets to be in the tent? It's a really tiny tent and who doesn't. There was a quote from uh, William McWilly, who was the governor of Mississippi in 1857 to 1859. He said, as a Christian people, it is the duty of the South to keep them in the present position at any cost and at every peril. Them was the enslaved Africans at the time. As a Christian people, it is the duty of the South to keep them in the present position at any cost and at every peril. There was another quote from Bob Jones, the evangelist in South Carolina, who said, God never meant for America to be a melting pot to run out the line between the nations. That was not God's purpose for this nation. There was the Reverend William Carter who said that desegregation is against the Bible. There were so many times throughout the museum when people said the way to be close to God is for me to be close to God and for everyone else to go away, segregated, separate, treated poorly, abused even. And you know that we do this today, right? You know that we use the phrase as a Christian people today. God never meant for America. We still use it today. We use it as justification for homophobia and for transphobia, for the oppression of women, and to justify our hatred for people of other religions, for Muslims and for Jews and for Wiccans and for uh, people of all different uh, understandings of God that we use as a Christian people to say who gets to be in the tent and who has to stay out there, who gets to be up on the holy hill, and it is a really small hill. Throughout the, um, throughout the pilgrimage, we saw many, many times when this was used, when this uh, separation of uh, this, this gross misunderstanding was used of Christianity. And I had this moment myself when I, um, when I was so very grateful um, to read the quote from Martin Luther King that is commonly known uh, as his epiphany when he sat at the kitchen table in his house, which we got to stand on the porch of. When he sat at the kitchen table and he said, I thought about the beautiful little daughter who had just been born his daughter, the darling of my life, he said. I'd come in night after night and see that gentle little smile, and I sat at the table thinking about that little girl and thinking about the fact that she could be taken away from me at any moment. And I discovered that religion had to become real to me, and I had to know God for myself. And he said, I bowed down over that cup of coffee, and I prayed a prayer, and I prayed out loud that night. He said, Lord, I'm down here trying to do what is right. I think I'm right. I think the cause that we represent is right, but Lord, I must confess that I'm losing my courage. And he said, then it happened. It seemed at that moment that I could hear an inner voice saying to me, stand up for righteousness, stand up for justice, stand up for truth. 
and lo, I will be with you even until the end of the world. He said, I heard the voice of Jesus saying still to fight on, and he promised to never leave me, never to leave me alone, never alone, never alone. Maybe you know that quote. It was in that moment that God said to Martin Luther King Jr., there is not a tent. Stand up for righteousness, stand up for justice, and I will be there with you. To be close to me, God said to Martin Luther King, to be close to me is to do the work of justice and righteousness. To be close to me is to be the one who is fighting for the marginalized and the oppressed. And that's why I want to read Stephen Mitchell's translation again. Stephen Mitchell's translation of Psalm 15, he says, Lord, who can be trusted with power? Because if we're really close to God, we have some good power, right? If we really have God with us, then we have good power. So, Lord, who can be trusted with power and who may act in your place? who may speak on your behalf, who may speak as a Christian. And he says, those with a passion for justice, who speak the truth from their hearts, and who have let go of selfish interests and grown beyond their own lives, who see the wretched as their family, and the poor as their flesh and blood. They alone are impartial and worthy of the people's trust. Their compassion lights up the whole earth and their kindness endures forever. So if it's a tent, it's still a hard one to get in. It's still a hard thing to do. It's still hard to be the people with a passion for justice who speak truth from our hearts. It's still hard to live without selfish interest. It's still hard to see the wretched as our family and the poor as our flesh and blood. But it is in these times that God is present with us, walking with us, that we are not alone. Toward the end of our pilgrimage in, in reflecting, um, we, had, we had gone to Kelly Ingram Park which is uh, the location of one of the um, very tragic moments in the civil rights movement. It's located right next to 16th Street Baptist Church, which is where uh, the bombing happened and those four sweet little girls were killed. Kelly Ingram Park uh, was, was a park where uh, school children protested Uh, They went to say they wanted desegregation in schools, and it was in that park that they experienced such a huge amount of violence um, with water hoses and with police dogs. And um, one of the women who was with us on the pilgrimage, an African-American woman in her uh, early, late 60s, early 70s, she said, um, she said, I'm not sure that I would have had the courage to do what they did. That I don't know if I would have been one of those school children. She said, I don't know that I could have done what Rosa Parks did. She said, um, I want to have that courage today to stand firmly against the wrongs in our society today. But it's hard to say if I have the courage to do it. We talk together about how when we draw closer to God, we have the courage to do the work of justice and righteousness. We have the ability to learn to love our neighbors more clearly that when we draw closer to God, we make the tent bigger, if there's a tent, we make the hill more smooth, we make God's presence as vast 
as the universe farther than we even knew existed. That when we draw close to God, we have the ability to find the courage. But that it is a daily practice. That we will never be perfect at it. That the question of who gets to dwell in this tent is not the same from one second to the next. Because it's a question of how close we are able to draw to God, given the obstacles that we put in our way. And so I wonder now, what do we do this week, today, next week? What do we do this second to remove some of those obstacles so that we can be closer to God? Knowing that closeness is not a place, a specific size, or anything like that, but that closeness is our ability to draw closer to God, to do what is right, to learn more about justice, and to learn more about what we're called to do. And the psalm ends then, Psalm 15. It says, those who do these things shall never be moved. That as we practice drawing closer to God, that as we practice the work of justice and righteousness, that as we practice what it looks like to pull in the outsider, to love our neighbor as ourselves, that the more we practice, the more stable we become, the deeper our roots grow, and the harder it is for us to be moved. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Beloved, go forth from this place moved towards the things that bring you closer to God, but deeply rooted in the things that do. And stay there on that holy hill or in that tent or in that grand universe planted close to God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen. Thank you.